I'll be in that seat, yeah. Uh, sure. Take that too. Can you, can you take that as well? Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for getting up at this, uh, for this early session today at the IAEA booth. Isn't this an incredible booth, everyone? Uh, for our session today, which is working toge together to deliver a clean energy mix. Now, um, before we get started, I, I'd like to extend my, my thanks and my appreciation to the World Nuclear Association uh, for helping to bring this together. Special thanks to Sama Bilbao y Leon, who has been such a leader in terms of helping to ensure great collaboration between the various national associations that represent nuclear, an industry which is going through so much momentum and innovation right now in terms of trying to deliver to its full potential as we move towards this clean energy mix. I also uh, would like to draw your attention to this incredible uh, booth. You know, uh, Adams for Climate, this is the, the, the very first time in, in COP's now long history that nuclear has had a platform uh, and a gathering place to be able to join in the important discussions around energy transition. It has been supported by a, a number of international and national uh, uh, nuclear bodies, and I think the result has been terrific. As each of you know, our nations, regardless of which one you come from, face a different challenge as we try to go through this energy transition. Today we're going to be speaking about Canada and the United States in particular, but let's take a moment to look at how these two nations have a different pathway through this energy transition. Canada itself has a relatively clean electricity system already, uh, based in large part thanks to a water power or hydro system, which represents almost two thirds of our electricity mix. That's followed by nuclear power, which represents 15, about 10%, uh, yeah, about 10 of the mix that we have in Canada right now. And it is uh, based in a couple of major provinces in terms of the nuclear presence, New Brunswick, uh, but also Ontario, which is a, sort of the center of gravity for nuclear and the basis on which uh, we're, we're doing some incredible innovation and collaborations with other uh, technologies. When you add wind and solar into the mix, that brings us up to about 82% non-emitting electricity grid. So clearly, as Canada strives to decarbonize its economy, our biggest challenge is not the low-hanging fruit of decarbon decarbonizing our electricity system, right? We do have to fix that remaining 18%, and then in Canada and the United States, we'll have to double or perhaps triple the amount of clean electricity that we have overall as we head towards 2050. But the low-hanging fruit, what we, we need to do right now in Canada, has a lot less to do with cleaning up the electricity system, a lot more to do with how much clean electricity can we bring on to the grid to be able to produce hydrogen, to be able to work with heavy industry to decarbonize fossil fuels. In the United States, and we're going to hear, we're going to hear later from an expert uh, on this, uh, Ralph Izzo, uh, it's, it's a bit of a different situation, right? I think we, they've got more of a 60-40 split in terms of the electricity system over there. So some, some, some good nuclear uh, some hydro, and when you add in wind and solar, about 
about 40% of the, the electricity grid is, is non-emitting, but 60% in the United States of the electricity grid of the current generating suite is going to have to be decarbonized, and with some heavy um, uh, and, and intense targets, right, by 2035, before the United States gets to the challenge of doubling or tripling their, their electricity mix. So interesting dynamics. We have a little bit of a, a, little bit of a team up uh, going here. We've got three Canadians uh, on stage who are, who are gonna be uh, trying to take on uh, Ralph Izzo as we talk about the dynamics in, in, in Canada and the United States around this energy transition. So without further ado, let me, uh, let me call up our panelists uh, one by one, if I may. I will start uh, in, uh, I'll, I'll start at the, f the far end with uh, Pat Dalzell, who is the head of corporate affairs for Bruce Power. Uh, Bruce Power, for those of you uh, who are, are not familiar with Bruce Power, runs the largest, if, if, if not one of the largest, nuclear power plants in the world, over six gigawatts. Uh, currently, Bruce Power, along with Ontario Power Generation are going through a refurbishment, a uh, major component replacement uh, that's planned for, for these uh, units. Uh, together, OPG and Bruce Power uh, proceeding now on time and on budget, which has been a very, very important uh, facet for the Canadian industry. Um, Pat is uh, also on the board of the Canadian Nuclear Association, so I'll have to be careful about uh, how hard I push him on various questions. A lot of softball questions here for Pat. Um, but is also responsible for achieving some very remarkable things as the person who, among his responsibilities, manages community relations, stakeholder relations, government relations. And uh, as anyone in uh, Ontario, uh, uh, anyone in Canada in the nuclear industry can tell you, Bruce Power has achieved some remarkable things in terms of the buy-in uh, from the nuclear communities around there and the overall support for nuclear, which, which is incredibly high, so thanks, Pat. Next, I'm going to invite uh, Ralph Izzo to, to join the stage. Ralph is the executive chair of the board of the Public Service Enterprise Group. Uh, this is his latest uh, responsibility. Uh, but previous to this, he was also the CEO, uh, as well as chair of that group. He is a, a recognized leader uh, in the energy industry, and, and in particular in energy policy in the United States. I'm delighted uh, that you could join us today, Ralph. It's good to see you again. Thank you for being here. Um, I did note when I was going through your bio that uh, early in your career, you were a research scientist at the Princeton Laboratories, and you, you uh, pursued uh, fusion for some time. So it must be interesting for you to see fusion actually coming online here. Uh, next, it is my great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, and ask on to stage the Honorable David Piccini, uh, Minister, if you would like to join us. Minister Piccini is the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks in Ontario, Canada. And as I mentioned, uh, Ontario is the center of gravity for all things nuclear in Canada. We are certainly expanding across the country uh, right now thanks to the incredible ecosystem that Ontario has helped create uh, in all sorts of different areas, including small modular uh, reactors. And Minister, if I may, I just uh, would like to, to call out your leadership in terms of not only your portfolio, but this very important bipartisan support that you and Minister Todd Smith and Premier Ford have been able to develop with the federal government as we go through this energy transition. That, that bipartisan work uh, is really just the kind of approach that we need as a world right now, and uh, we very much appreciate uh, you being able to join us today. Lastly, uh, but certainly not least, uh, my friend Francis Bradley, uh, who is the CEO of Electricity Canada. Some of you would have known Electricity Canada as the Canadian Electricity Association in a, in a, previous, uh, a previous life. You know, Electricity Canada oversees the entire electricity ecosystem in Canada from a private sector point of view, right? And representing public utilities, but the entire electricity uh, system as through their membership and through their work as the voice for the electricity system. Um, Francis, a long, a long time with the, electricity, uh, with the Electricity Association, but also now with your roles as um, really leading or participating in I would say most of the major bodies that are looking over the transformation of the electricity system, which has been important. But very notably, thank you for your work in terms of 
taking an all technology approach, which is promoting uh, the need for all technologies as we go towards this clean energy future. That's been a real uh, symbol of success for Canada. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to have a seat now, and uh, we'll we'll get the uh, we'll get the session formally underway. Oh, all right then. Um, so as I as I said at the beginning, this is all about us. Uh, it's all about us. It's, it's, it's about uh, working together uh, to deliver a clean energy mix as we go forward to 2050. And um, I thought we would start, well, first a, a couple of notes here. I've got a, a number of questions and I'm going to try to direct them to, to the various uh, uh, areas of expertise of our panelists. Uh, however, to start with, I thought maybe we could have some opening comments uh, just to get a bit better understanding about how you view this challenge and, and the role in it and perhaps we'll start right here with uh, Francis Bradley. Okay, well, thank you very much, John, and thank you to, to, the, to the people that have put this panel together. really appreciate the opportunity to join you this morning. Uh, this morning being November 15th, 2022, uh, and as of today, there are now 4,794 days left until um, uh, our federal government has pledged that Canada's electricity system will be uh, a green one. Now, 4,794 might sound like a big number, but it's not. Uh, by the government's estimation, Canada will need two to three times the amount of clean electricity it produces now to decarbonize the other sectors of the economy by 2050. But for the 2035 aspiration, 13 years away, 4,794 days to build the system to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from our sector while adding capacity to the electricity grid and ensuring that it continues to be affordable, reliable, and resilient. So the electricity um, industry has known for some time that it would have a significant uh, central role uh, to play in Canada's net zero future. And, and the members of Electricity Canada uh, have unveiled a variety of net zero announcements over the past year. We've had some promising signs as well from uh, the federal government in the recent fall economic statement uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and the nuclear sector, I think, is, is right to be pleased uh, with some of the major announcements made in the, economic, the fall economic statement. But even so, we have a lot to do. Implementation of our net zero commitments is going to require us as the theme of this panel says, to work together to deliver a clean energy mix. This will require collaboration with and the support of government, regulators, indigenous communities and other civil society groups. And it will not be easy. While Canada has the advantage of having one of the cleanest electricity grids in the world, as John mentioned, less than 20% of our power today comes from fossil fuels. To do this in 13 years is not a lot of time. You know, as you all know, we can't simply flick a switch and have a greater electricity grid. Uh, you know, as, as you're all aware, it takes time to build uh, um, large infrastructure. For example, a, like a large hydroelectric dam uh, can take 25 years to plan, get approved, and to build. Transmission lines are, are hugely complicated to get uh, to survey and then to build. Even making sure that the, the, the poles uh, on the average street are ready for the increased load is going to take years uh, of investment. So in short, there is a lot that needs to be done. But it's good to be here to talk uh, with you about how we might work together in order to achieve this. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Francis. I mean, a, a clear theme there being the urgency. And while we're making some progress, uh, a lot of hurdles to go through. Um, Minister Piccini, over to you. Thanks very much, John. It's wonderful to be here with, with all of you today uh, to speak a bit about the work Ontario's doing uh, to decarbonize and the importance of nuclear. I'd, I'd first start off by saying, uh, as, a, as a politician in Ontario, um, we very much see there is no transition, there's no net zero without nuclear. And we're incredibly grateful for the men and women of, of of Bruce, Darlington, and beyond, uh, who get up each and every day uh, to power us to a cleaner future. Um, of course, Ontario's uh, played a, a significant leadership role in Canada in decarbonizing 27% uh, emissions reductions since 2005. Uh, we're the single largest decarbonizer in, uh, in, in North America today, and uh, large part due uh, to the significant efforts that you mentioned, John, uh, to phase out coal. Uh, that was the single largest 
uh, effort to phase out coal in North America's history. Um, the supply mix, as, as was mentioned, in Ontario is, is over 60% nuclear, uh, with 23% hydroelectric, 12% wind and solar, bioenergy. And of course, uh, for the nuclear mix, we also boast incredible talent and technology in the province of Ontario. I, it, was the, it was in Ontario in the 50s, I believe, that, uh, that we first established can-do technology. And of course, Ontarians have uh, taken that te technology to the world ever since. Uh, planned refurbishments, as was mentioned by John at Darlington and Bruce, are going to secure a long-term supply of reliable, low-cost power for decades to come in the province of Ontario. Uh, this is backed up uh, by incredible investments. Um, we're seeing uh, an economic benefit of over $90 billion to Ontario's GDP with Darlington's refurbishment and over 14,000 jobs through the lifespan. Bruce uh, Power, and you'll hear more from Pat, so I don't want to scoop him, but we're excited about the incredible leadership we've seen uh, from Bruce, and, and that's going to, of course, uh, increase employment by 22,000 jobs per year and gener generate $4 billion in annual economic uh, benefits to communities throughout uh, the province of Ontario. Of course, I'd be remiss if I just didn't touch at, at the end here on small modular uh, reactors, SMRs. Ontario has worked very collaboratively with both the federal government and other provinces, or, or for those of you unfamiliar, it's equivalent to states in, uh, in Canada, in a collaborative manner to secure uh, an investment. We're partnering with GE Hitachi Nuclear Energy to deploy an SMR at Darlington site, uh, the only site in Canada licensed uh, for a new nuclear build right now. This will showcase our expertise, uh, the benefits, of course, are shorter timelines, reliable baseload power, and we estimate over $5.3 billion in, uh, in economic benefits in Canada and, and access to $150 billion worldwide through SMRs. So they have the potential, we know, to drive job creation, and I'm very excited that Ontario uh, will be the province that will roll out uh, the first SMR. Uh, it's estimated in, in, a, in a few years. So we're very excited about the work that's being done as Minister of Environment, of course, we play an important role from a permitting, permission standpoint, and, and we're working collaboratively with the federal government, with other provincial colleagues uh, to that end. So it's exciting to be here. Thank you very much for having me, John. Thank you, Minister. And, and um, I'm glad that you, uh, that you brought up the coal phase out in Ontario, which, as I understand it, is certainly the largest decarbonization uh, event in North America, if not the entire uh, world. Um, so thank you for that. John, thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here with you. you know, Francis and I were together in Oslo a couple of months ago, and he counted down the days there, too. And I remember thinking, okay, well, you know, two days have elapsed. We, we can get this done. And as someone who recognizes the urgency, I must tell you, it moved me that, oh, my goodness, 65 days have passed now, which is 1.5% of the days left. So as someone who believed he understood the urgency, uh, Francis, that's a great tool, and I would encourage you to keep using it, not that you need my encouragement. Uh, so uh, look, we have a vision at PSEG uh, of a transition that w notwithstanding the importance of affordability and energy security is one in which our customers use less energy tomorrow than they use today. I think if I took a poll of everyone here and asked how many folks woke up this morning saying, I'm looking forward to using a kilowatt hour or a BTU? Not too many people would say, yes, that was exactly what I thought when I woke up this morning. Uh, secondly, that the energy we use is cleaner than ever before. In my lifetime, that meant fine particulate matter, SO2, NOx, mercury. Thank goodness we've moved beyond that and now recognize the issues uh, associated with greenhouse gases, something as benign I, we thought when we were younger, uh, CO2. And then, regrettably, the fact that uh, we really... Francis, actually, I don't know that we have 4,600 days, but we're feeling the effects now. And so, therefore, adaptation and making sure that our grid is reliable enough to recognize the value of, of electricity, especially in the U.S. I don't know the Canadian numbers. As we move electricity from being 20% of our energy consumption to electrifying the economy, to John's point earlier about having to build more. And we could spend some more time on each of those three-part vision of using less, using cleaner, 
and delivering more reliably, uh, hopefully, as the panel goes on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. And I, I think that's, um, aside from the urgency, I think that's an interesting and important point that you've reinforced here about uh, people really needing to have energy literacy and understand, understand better how they're using energy and what the implications are, right? So, uh, Pat, over to you. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, happy to be here this morning. Great to see you all. Uh, all excited about learning a little bit more about how nuclear can help fight climate change. Um, as has been mentioned, and I think Minister Puccini covered all my talking points already, but uh, I'll try and add to that if I can. Um, we are uh, the world's largest operating nuclear facility uh, located on the shores of Lake Huron, where we produce about a third of Ontario's electricity. Of course, that's all emissions free. Uh, and, uh, and certainly a huge economic driver to that part of the province as well as all of southwestern Ontario, really, when you look at the ripple effect of the investments made through the vast supply chain that's all based uh, in Ontario. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great story that we have to tell in, in nuclear. And, you know, as was mentioned, though, not everybody are, you know, nuclear energy policy wonks, right? Not everybody understands, you know, when they flip on their switch, ooh, I wonder, you know, how many kilowatt hours are, you know, uh, fossil fuel versus nuclear. But to me, there's a, a really, you know, obvious um, uh, sign that you can point to, to to describe the impact that nuclear can have on fighting climate change. And it is that coal phase out that Minister Puccini referred to. It is the single largest GHG emissions reduction initiative in the world, I think, uh, when we phased out coal. And, you know, that, that's great to say, but in my mind, when you really want to try to wrap your head around what that means, I look back at when I first moved to Toronto in the early 2000s, and I remember on any hot summer day, you'd look up at the sky and there was this orange haze in the sky. There was no blue sky. You didn't see it. Uh, it was smog. And in 2005, we had 55 smog days in Toronto. It was significant. The decision to phase out coal was a result of what, of what you know, the impact that coal was having on our, on our climate, our environment, on the sky. We phased out coal over a 10 year period. By 2014, we burned our last piece of coal in Ontario. And since that day, there's not been one smog day in Ontario. You look up at the sky on a hot summer day, it is a blue sky. And that's the difference that fighting climate change can make. 70% of the incremental energy needed to phase out coal in Ontario was provided by Bruce Power, as we brought Bruce A back online. We refurbished two units, and we're in the process right now of refurbishing the remaining six. The reason that's important is that it will provide the incremental energy needed to stay off of coal for the next 40 years, out to the mid-2060s and beyond. It's a huge accomplishment for the province, and its jurisdictions around the world are looking at how they can phase off coal within their systems. I think Ontario has provided a great case for how it can be done effectively, cost effectively, uh, to the benefit of ratepayers, and at the same time driving the economy. The key message here is it can be done. It can be done in a fairly short timeline, but you have to take action. It's not about policy papers. It's not about talking the rhetoric. It's about taking action, making it happen. So thanks. Thanks very much, Pat. So we're, we're going to move into uh, sort of a, a, a question round now. And I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm going to start directing some questions. But if, uh, probably two per question, but if any of the panelists want to add on, let's, let's accommodate that if, if we could. Pat, I'm, I'm uh, I just, you know, the, the Bruce Power uh, nuclear plant tours are famous in, in Canada. You go out wondering what nuclear is in and you come out uh, being a champion, right? But I just, I want to relate to you that the, the, the experience I had at Bruce Power at the very end, you've done this tour, you're standing uh, on this platform looking over the steam generators. I remember, Pat, the CNO took his uh, mobile phone, looked up how much electricity was being uh, produced and used in Ontario at the time. You're right, a third. Uh, at, at the time, it was more because there were, there were energy sources that weren't really producing. You can imagine one plant providing our most populous province with all of that power was incredible. I'm going to move to, uh, to you, Ralph, for the first question and then, and then to Francis so with the same question because I want the U.S.-Canada comparison here. But this, this low uh, carbon energy transition that we're discussing, it's going to look different in the U.S. than it does in Canada. What would you say is uh, unique about the U.S. that is 
either going to make it easier or more challenging to go through this energy transition? So the similarities between the U.S. and Canada, and I'm sure someone will be able to find a way to dispel the accuracy of what I'm about to say, is we are two of the world's most inefficient users of energy. Uh, if you take total energy used and divide it by a reasonable number in the bottom, per capita, per dollar of GDP, what I said I believe is, is accurate. I'm, if you divide it by something else, I don't know, then maybe that won't be true. So that means that we both have a lot of opportunity, candidly on the demand side, and on greater energy efficiency, which goes to sort of the first part of the PSEG vision. Th that's where we are similar. Another place where we are similar, and this is only recently, is that most of the CO2 does not come from electricity generation in the US and Canada, albeit uh, Canada is a much cleaner system, as you pointed out. Uh, the US 40% carbon free, uh, t half of that carbon free energy is nuclear, so our reliance on nuclear is qualitatively similar to Canada, but not quantitatively similar to Canada. Uh, the other 20% comes from hydro and solar and wind, as you mentioned, split about evenly. Although two-thirds of electric generation that was new to the grid last year in the U.S. was solar and wind. Uh, our number one source of CO2 emissions now is transportation. I suspect that's true of Canada, too. So there's, there's a fair amount of similarity. I am truly envious of a major, major difference that was pointed out by all of my colleagues here in the panel which is Canada's effectiveness and progress on new nuclear and refurbishing old nuclear. And we've had some challenges in the US that we just have to overcome. We've had two plants file for a second life extension and they were granted that life extension and then we had, oops, never mind, we, uh, we didn't mean to do that and it was pulled back. Uh, that's not a joking matter and I shouldn't, I shouldn't make light of it. Uh, so they are back in the regulatory process to try to get reissued their second life extension. The minister talked about SMR that's going to be operational in a few years. We only have one SMR technology that has design license approval at this point. We have some great uh, technologies that are soon to come. Full disclosure, I'm on the board of Terra Power. So uh, obviously I'm a huge fan of that technology. So I do think the U.S. has a lot of catch-up to do on nuclear technology, but given our need to go from 18%, uh, I, I may have used 20% before, but to be more accurate, 18% uh, electricity being part of our total economy, and to triple or quadruple that, depending upon whether or not we succeed at developing CCUS and, and not need to electrify certain parts of the economy, nuclear has to be a vital role in that. We cannot rely on 40% capacity factors from wind 20% capacity factor from solar and ignore the 90 plus percent capacity factor from nuclear. So when I hear the things that Bruce has done, when I hear the things that the province of Ontario has done, there are big differences in our regulatory enthusiasm for nuclear and I'm, uh, I'm repeating myself but I'm jealous of that. Please uh, keep the microphone for uh, just a moment if you would, uh, Ralph, uh, before passing it to Francis. Um, firstly, uh, thank you for, uh, you know, giving a shout out to the Canadian nuclear industry and some of the work we're doing with small modular reactors. And I think to your opening comment, the role that small modular reactors with high temperature heat might be able to play in, in decarbonizing some hard to abate areas, right? And we're proud of that. I, I can also tell you that as Canadians, we're, we're quite self-conscious about uh, keeping up with the United States and try to ensure that we remain on the U.S. radar uh, so that we can continue to have the coordination and collaboration. Would you mind, would you mind commenting? Uh, so that, that's a way of saying that you know we're, we, we strive to, to be in lockstep or even a little bit leading so that we can continue that. Um, but the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, could be a game changer in terms of how the U.S. approaches nuclear. Would you just, just comment on that? It, it absolutely is a game changer. So. Uh, First of all, for the existing nuclear fleet, which was at great peril in some of the deregulated markets in the United States, and yet it represents 50% of the carbon-free electricity generated in the U.S. now, there is a production tax credit 
that is on a sliding scale. It depends on what wholesale power prices are at the market. Uh, and that it could be as high as $15 per megawatt hour and it could be as low as zero. Even at its peak, $15 a megawatt hour, that's the equivalent of a carbon uh, avoidance price of about $22 per ton, which is well below the social cost of carbon and just about any study one reads. So the IRA did a great job of preserving the base. And then it did something that was also important. It said, by, in 2025, we're going to incentivize carbon-free energy through an investment tax credit or a production tax credit. And uh, it, the, the, the numbers vary depending on where you build, the amount of domestic content, et cetera, et cetera. But what was essential about it is it said, as long as it's carbon-free. So it was a huge win for nuclear in a recognition that it wasn't specific to solar or to wind, whether that's onshore wind or offshore wind, and it put nuclear on an equal footing with those technologies. So this is tremendously important. And you've heard numbers probably about the $269 billion of tax credits that this implies. That, that's an estimate. It, you could possibly double that, triple that, quadruple that. It, it just depends on what the electric supply needs are and uh, what the appetite for doing it is. I, I am not a cop veteran. This is only my second cop. And last year was my first, and it was great. Last year, I had this warm feeling that everyone was welcoming the U.S. back to COP. Uh, this year, I feel a little bit like people think that the IRA uh, maybe is going to create a huge competitive advantage for U.S. companies, and maybe some people are regretting that they poked the bear a little bit too much. Uh, and I think it's wonderful. I think let's, you know, let's race to the top and get it done. Ralph, thank you so much for that. And, and uh Talking about poking the bear, so our uh, Canada is is responding, right? We've just come out with an economic statement that is striving to put uh, Canada on an equal footing with the IRA. They've extended uh, investment tax credits to small modular reactors and opened the door for large. We're going to make sure it's extended to large so that we, we do keep up that parity. Now, um, Francis, uh, over to you with uh, the, same, the same question. How are things going to look, because they look different in each country. What, do you, what is unique about Canada and the transition? We're going through opportunities, challenges? Yeah, so, so what's unique about Canada uh, is, is both, um, it both makes it easier and it makes it more challenging uh, to achieve that low carbon energy transition. So there's sort of two, two sides of the same coin. Um, you know, as, as we said earlier, 82% of, of Canada's electricity uh, grid is non-emitting. So, I mean, that's the upside. Uh, we're, we're further ahead than, than, uh, than many industrialized countries. Um, the problem is that remaining 18%, uh, and they're in parts of the country uh, which uh, uh, are challenged to install non-emitting sources. They do not uh, you know, have access to the same resource base. So in order to achieve that remaining 18%, we'll have to accelerate all kinds of things. Uh, we're going to need to accelerate investment in, in electrifying the country, certainly. And we've begun to see that happen you know, with the recent fall economic statement uh, that's going to support uh, significant, we hope, investments uh, in uh, clean technologies. But we need to move uh, faster. Uh, we need to act now when it comes to the regulatory framework uh, of existing electricity systems to allow for more investments. We also need to break log jams in building infrastructure. Uh, and um, Ralph uh, had, had mentioned that uh, we were together at the uh, International Electricity Summit uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and that came up um, in every jurisdiction. This is a concern uh, really right across the industrialized world, the challenges of, of, uh, of building infrastructure. So th those log jams in terms of building infrastructure, and, and a, a wonderful recent example, wonderful, I, I, I pick the word with, with care, but uh, uh, a particular example was um, we, we saw uh, the announcement of a, uh, a really interesting, innovative project in Newfoundland and Labrador. Offshore wind um, producing hydrogen. Terrific project. It's, it can be built in 18 to 24 months. The problem is it's going to take 8 to 10 years uh, in order to get it permitted. So that's 13 years. And if you remember what I said earlier, John, and I'm sure you now remember the exact number, 4,794 days. Um, that kind of puts us right up against the back of that. And, you know, adding to that is just overall, uh, you know, the World Bank recently uh, ranked Canada 64th in the world in terms of the, the ease and speed of obtaining construction permits. So it, it really is right across all levels. This, so it's a big challenge for us. Um, so even though we may be further ahead at 82%, uh, 
uh, that, that last 18% is going to be a very significant challenge. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. And what a perfect segue for, for um, Minister Pacini, who I'm going to turn to next with a question. But uh, Francis, I just want to assure you that Minister Pacini said that he's going to take care of the approval streamlining across the country. No problem. We'll be done tomorrow. If so you can. If only there was just one level of government to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> um, Minister, you know, uh, Ontario is a leader in, in, in various technologies that, that you've already mentioned, a big focus for your government in certain places, whether it's EVs, critical minerals, nuclear, etc. cetera. Um, but these industries are all focused on their own technologies, right? There's, it's almost a tribalism. But as we know, uh, you know, this transition is going to take collaboration and multiple technologies working together. So what do you see as the main opportunities uh, in Ontario for further collaboration between these industries and technologies? Well, I the think that's a great question. I just want to briefly touch on permitting because that's a big issue. And I, I often get uh, wide eyes and, and surprises when the Minister of Environment rolls into northern Ontario and you get the presentations on decarbonizing, on tree planting reclamation work, which is vital and critically important. But then I say, I'm here to talk permitting, and we want to reduce our timelines. And let's talk about the 50-year-old environmental assessment process in the province of Ontario that hasn't been touched. I mean, I'm not 50 years old. This thing predates me as minister. And, and so they're shocked. I mean, it, it, I usually get a, a tepid response, and then once we ease into a conversation, John, they open up and we get good ideas. And, and that stems to your collaboration piece. We're doing that in the north. I mean, we're, we're dealing with a national discussion on reconciliation with indigenous communities in Canada, and Ontario takes that very seriously. And a few of the changes we've done, uh, I, I think, to a recent uh, waste and, and, and water announcement that we announced, we led with, with an environmental report um, utilizing existing infrastructure, bypassed the need for environmental assessment, but led with duty to consult, engaging communities, funding it off the top. That sent a signal that we're here to collaborate, that we value uh, Indigenous input, and, and it's been met uh, with, with a lot of uh, optimism. And, and so, I, you know, we're, we're seized with that permitting process discussion. We're going to do it through collaborating with industry. We have industry-focused working groups. Um, we are engaging Indigenous communities. I, I also would say labor has an important role to play at the table in this. And, uh, a bit of a shout out to Bruce here. We were meeting with uh, labor leaders from across Canada the other day, and they said, again, back to collaboration and a just transition, you must have labor there. When I go knocking on doors at an election time, I mean, I think I'm the, one of the few up here, if not the only one, that actually will take about you know two years prior to election to start knocking on every single door of constituents in my riding. When I look in the eyes of the hardworking men and women in, in the sector, they want to see that that decarbonizing and that a future involves them. They are involved in it, they're leading it, they have a role. They don't just wanna see uh, job insecurity and, and what does that mean for me? So you have to, to do that, you have to engage labor. And I know Bruce is often cited as an example by labor leaders, by union leaders, as you want to know what a just transition looks like, you want to know what labor uh, looks like, collaboration, speak to Bruce. So I think there's an acknowledgement that we have to be collaborative, um, I think you know, uh, to be frank, I'll, you have a politician here, so I'll, I'll touch briefly on politics. The political spectrum, right and left, often you see the ambition and the platitudes of the left met with the pragmatism and, and action-oriented, uh, you know, mechanisms of, of, of those who sit right, center, right. And, and I think in Canada, what's nice is that we haven't seen perhaps the polarization that we might have seen in other countries. That's not to say everything is kumbaya in Canada either. Um, we have our differences, but we're working collaboratively. The federal government stood shoulder to shoulder with the provincial government in Ontario to announce a backstop and support, financial support for SMRs. Um, and we're working together to achieve that. So I fundamentally believe that, uh, you know, net zero needs nuclear. It's, it's a bipartisan issue and one that will require collaboration. Thank you, Minister. And, and while you didn't uh, mention it, maybe out of modesty, but part of that collaboration has been Ontario's leadership in terms of bringing together three other provinces, right, to, to 
work on nuclear collaboratively with that memorandum of understanding. And so it's not just federal, it's the, the sharing of uh, ambitions and, and even resources when it comes to uh, forwarding nuclear and other things. Pat, I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, this, the, the same question. You know, uh, opportunities for, for further, uh, or challenges for further collaboration as we go through this transition. Yeah, uh, thanks, John, and, and thanks, Minister, for, for highlighting. I mean, working with our, uh, our labor force is uh, uh, existential to what we do, right? We, we need the support of organized labor. We need the support of our communities. We need the support of the broader province. And working together is, is absolutely essential to what we do. John, to your, to your question uh, about working collaboratively with other technologies, you know, one of the things that, uh, that we've committed to um, as part of our commitment uh, to, uh, to achieving net zero by 2027 uh, and, and uh, enabling new innovation in the energy space is working uh, with, with hydrogen. Uh, so we've, we've committed to providing a feasibility study back to the province, and I promise the minister it's on its way, uh, for, for Q1 of next year, uh, looking at uh, hydrogen production. You know, one of, one of the funny things about the world of hydrogen is the, the various colors of the rainbow associated with hydrogen. Um, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, nuclear hydrogen is pink. Um, okay. You know, when... Trying to make one type of hydrogen production better than the other, to me, is counterproductive. You know, hydrogen can be made, can be produced, consumed in all jurisdictions around the world, certainly across the provinces in Canada. Uh, and in Ontario, you know, one of, the, one of the real resources that we have is the nuclear industry and the clean electricity we produce. And we think that there is a, a natural uh, opportunity there to tie that in with hydrogen production. So that's one of the energy... Um, uh, innovation pieces that we're focused on. Then I, I think of, of other areas where, where um, you know, clean energy production tied to nuclear makes sense. I think large-scale storage. You know, one of the things about nuclear is it tends to run flat out all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's not how an electricity demand curve works, right? It goes down at night, then up again in the day, and then back down. Uh, so those profiles don't match. One way to optimize baseload power from nuclear energy is to grow emissions-free storage. And that's one of the things the province of Ontario is committed to, is growing the, uh, their distributed storage network. I know that there are a number of uh, pump storage projects that are being looked at, including one relatively close to us that's being developed or, pr or uh, promoted by our parent company, TC Energy. And if you think of what they do, they can pump water up into a reservoir at night when demand is low and then when demand goes up during the day they can then send it down through a generator where it can produce some of the peaking needs and ramping needs of the Ontario electricity system during the day. Great opportunity to maximize the value of clean baseload electricity provided by nuclear and other hydro facilities. So those are just a couple of examples where the nuclear industry can work with other areas of energy innovation. Uh, thank you Pat. I'm, um you know, this, uh, this really important concept that you brought up, that we need to shift away from colors and shift towards just measuring the carbon intensity, you know, of, of how we're producing hydrogen is really key. And it's, it's, been, it's, been, um, it's been discussed in a number of different uh, forums over the course of the last few days. So let's hope that we move in that direction. Um, I'm going to go back to you, uh, Ralph, for this next question, and, and, then, and then Francis. Something that is of, of real interest to me, just at a, a personal level, and it, it has to do with the current energy crisis that we face because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And the way that this is playing out at a time when I think the world was just getting a lot of momentum behind the energy transition for climate reasons only. Now we've got energy security in the mix. Different regions of the world are going to either use this to accelerate the transition or perhaps it's going to stall. What is your view uh, globally, but, but, but also what do, you, what do you think the dynamics can result in in the U.S.? Sure, no, that's a great question. Before I answer that, I do want to comment on something the minister said. There are two things I'm glad about. You, you talked about polarization in some countries. Uh, number one, uh, I haven't noticed any polarization in the United States. Number two, I'm glad my middle name is now Pinocchio. Uh, but n when it comes to nuclear power, that is the one area where it seems the two parties, which are obviously polarized, can work together. Historically, 
uh, and I'm not making a political statement here, the Republicans have been very supportive of nuclear and the Democrats have been somewhat suspicious, but the IRA was passed with a Democratic majority in the Senate. And I do think there's a, there's a, a widely held recognition of the important role of nuclear. In fact, uh, I have to do a shout out to Chris Levesque, the CEO of TerraPower, who's in the audience, who just did a press conference with Special Envoy Kerry on something called Project Phoenix, where we'll develop uh, small modular reactors at coal sites as part of the uh, just transition. So you know, some obvious effects of the Russian invasion. My nose didn't grow, right? Okay, so uh, on the polarization issue only. Uh, one of the things that we had in the past, obviously, was a global price on oil. But natural gas was very regional. And now natural gas is not quite where oil is, but it's certainly become more global. So I don't know uh, as well the statistics in the UK and Germany in terms of the escalation in natural gas prices, but they were staggering. Uh, but they weren't zero in our part of the country. They're up 20, uh, a factor of three. Thanks to our storage, the customer bill is only going up 25% as opposed to 300%. So I think there are several things that get triggered by this. Number one is how can we help our allies? Francis and I heard direct appeals from our EU colleagues saying you need to expand the permitting of LNG facilities. We cannot, from a geopolitical stability point of view, be dependent on North, uh, uh, North Star. Uh, so, so number one is I do think, and I've encouraged the Secretary of Energy to think about increasing the LNG capabilities of the US. I think that's gonna have a huge benefit for carbon-free energy in the US. It's not something that, sorry, Minister, politicians like to hear about. It's gonna require that we open up the next well to supply that natural gas, and that next well is gonna be a more expensive well. So you're gonna see gas prices go up as exports go out, right? Supply and demand, demand increases, supply has to match that, the next unit of supply is more expensive. But that's okay, because the United States does not have a price on carbon, and that's hurting carbon-free sources of energy in our country. So that will put an implicit price on carbon into the market, and that will allow the United States to invest more heavily in small modular reactors, solar and wind. The beauty of COP is you realize the global nature of the challenge has different solutions at different points in time and in different locations. As much as a, I am a huge fan of SMRs, I don't think we should build one in Freetown, Sierra Leone to keep people from using charcoal and wood to cook. That's not the right solution there, but maybe LNG or LP, L, uh, uh, LPG is. So uh, you know, the, the notion that the just transition has to take place in the context of energy security for geopolitical stability and affordability, I think is gonna have multiple benefits. I really do, it's gonna push us to carbon-free energy and hopefully push us to using our fossil resources to help those economies that can benefit from those fossil resources instead of building, I think at last count, 610 coal plants between China and India. All right, so, so I, I, I and, and, and you know, one final thought, I don't wanna dominate the mic. My industry has done some wonderful things in reducing carbon. But we've been a bit fraudulent in our claims. We'd like to have the world believe it was because of all the renewable energy we, we built. That's not what happened. We replaced coal with natural gas. That's how we drove down carbon emissions. That's not a long-term solution, but that is a bridge solution that's important. Thank you for that. Um, very, very insightful. Francis, uh, over to you, same, same issue. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I'm, I, w I was struck, again, because last time Ralph and I saw each other was, was at that, uh, that uh, International Electricity Summit. I was concerned kind of on the flight over that, that um, given the, the, the ongoing crisis um, um, uh, as a result of the invasion of the Ukraine, was going to, uh, what we were going to see is people stepping back from their commitments to the transition. I was, I was very, very encouraged that, m that pretty much everybody we heard from and everybody we spoke to uh, at that event in the electricity sector um, uh, was talking about, no, this, this is a, a further uh, inducement to double down and to speed up that transition. So, so that was certainly, uh, certainly very much encouraging. But I'd like to turn the question around somewhat, uh, John, uh, because, you know, for, for the electricity sector to take advantage of this particular moment in time, need to go back to the issue that, I, that may sound like I'm harping on it, but we do need to, to address the, the regulatory morass that, that is hindering us um, so, that, so that we can uh, take advantage of this 
this point in time. I talked about this is a multi-jurisdictional issue. It isn't, it isn't just a, a single jurisdiction. Uh, we've got you know, a division between uh, different levels of government uh, for resource management between the federal government, 10 provinces, uh, three territories, um, and then there's some, some, some uh, you know, other, other levels of government as well. Each province has taken its own approach to electricity policy. Each province has its own economic regulatory system, its own ownership, its own industry structure. The result is that the federal and provincial territories on energy are often not aligned, certainly not across 13 provinces and territories and the federal government. So electricity uh, regulation in Canada was modeled after railroads. Uh, it was determined in an age um, when climate change wasn't even in our vocabulary. It was designed to protect the consumer uh, as well it should, but right now innovation and net zero are not even considered in the decision-making processes with many utility regulators whose focus is solely on cost. But that's because the, the regulatory um, uh, compact within which they operate is determined by regulation. It needs to be updated. At the federal level, um, the in, uh, electricity industry is affected by over 90 different regulations that are either in force or pending. These stretch across 31 different statutes. Uh, covering issues as diverse as greenhouse gas emissions, uh, species at risk, migratory birds, navigation protection, and more. Um, the Impact Assessment Act and the Fisheries Act that were both amended in 2019 in Canada added uh, uh, the, to this growing level of regulation in Canada, which is seriously impeding our progress. Um, we need to be um, thinking about how it can, we can move through uh, these jurisdictional issues and do it better. And then long term, Creative thinking is, is going to be necessary to solve our most pressing uh, problems that, that are outside of the regulatory construct that are making it difficult to, to, for utilities to invest in, in innovative solutions. And I think that's the, the challenge, but it's also the opportunity that's facing us now. Thank you for underscoring that uh, regulatory challenge. No, no pressure, Minister. No, no pressure when you're, when you're in your discussions. So listen, a little bit of housekeeping here. I know we, we, we're, we're only going to have a time for one more question. Um, questions from the floor haven't really worked in this forum, so I'm going to encourage you, if you have a question, to come up and speak to the panelists afterwards. I'm going to direct this uh, next question to Minister Piccini and uh, Pat, but I'm going to start with Pat and give the minister the last word. And a, 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 a heads up for all panelists, a variation of the last question, which, which we're not going to get to in full, is really what gives you hope that we're going to be able to make this transition work? So. Keep in mind, I'm going to ask you just for a point on, on what it is that, that gives you hope and if you like what it is that keeps you awake at night, okay? So, uh, Pat, and I'll, I'll just draw your attention to my socks, Pat. This was a subtle hint for you that I hope you'll be able to work isotopes into this last answer regardless of what the question is. Um, clean energy has major environmental benefits, but there's also financial benefits, right? Uh, as we make this shift. So how will a low-carbon energy transition uh, be economically beneficial for the country as a whole and for individuals. Yeah, thanks, John, and love the socks. Um, and, and for any of you wondering what those socks are, they're lutetium and cobalt socks, a couple of, uh, couple of elements that I'll get into. And John's question was about the economic benefit, some side economic benefits of nuclear. But I, I think what I want to talk about is, is more about just additional benefits of, of nuclear. Um, and, you know, one thing that, uh, that has touched all of our lives, every single one of us, and anybody around the world can relate to this, is, is cancer, right? Uh, nobody can avoid it. It's inevitable. It will touch all of us. It has touched all of us. Uh, and, and, and the reason I want to talk about cancer is because of what we're doing right now with our power reactors. So for years, we've produced an isotope called cobalt-60, and it's used to sterilize medical equipment. It's used around the world. It has been for decades. A number of years ago, the research reactor at, uh, at Chalk River in, uh, in Ontario uh, closed, and the supply of something called high-specific activity, cobalt-60, was going to disappear. And this is used in a treatment called the gamma knife. And if you can picture a helmet sort of thing with 200 beams of gamma radiation, the individual beams don't do anything to surrounding tissue, but where they meet at a focal point, they act as this non-invasive knife that can essentially cut out a tumor without having to cut into a person's head. Uh, that isotope was at risk of disappearing with the closure, closure of this research reactor. 
So we worked with our partners at Nordion to change our cobalt-60 process so that we could produce this cancer-fighting gamma knife cobalt-60 called high-specific activity cobalt-60. And with that change, it set us down a road of, of finding new ways to fight cancer. And just a couple of weeks ago, we announced for the first time ever the commercial production of Lutetium-177. That's a complicated way of saying a really revolutionary, game-changer way of fighting prostate cancer. Uh, medical isotopes are being used in all kinds of innovative treatments around the world right now, and the only challenge to these treatments is supply. As we equip and retrofit our can-do power reactors in Ontario to produce medical isotopes, we're changing the game. We're creating an unmatched capacity, reliability, and redundancy in these huge reactors and providing uh, a treatment that's never been available in this way before, and we're shipping it globally. So something that benefits all of us everywhere around the world and something we're extremely proud of at Bruce Power. Thank you very much, Pat. So, Minister, you're bringing us home on this, uh, on this last and same question about the sort of financial opportunity that there is here. Absolutely. Well, I think, I, just briefly, I had touched on an important point. We're all globally dealing with the costs related to COVID pandemic, healthcare costs, uh, one of the you know, number one expenditures in on Ontario and the capital costs that we're seeing. Uh, so, so the work that, that Pat and the team and everybody's doing is incredibly important to our healthcare sector. And why that matters to the economy, I mean, it, it's, it's a big expenditure. I think we spoke about the incredible economic benefits SMRs you know, will bring up in excess of five billion uh, in, in Canada. We know uh, the 76,000 people who get up each and every day in the, in the nuclear sector uh, through employment. I'm, I'm, I'm excited as well when we look um, when we look at the opportunities to train and and I talked a bit about just transition and what that looks like and training um, you know the from a public policy standpoint we've invested incredible amounts into the skilled trades into transitioning um, you know e so every individual regardless of your age because I think there's an acknowledgement certainly in Ontario across Canada United States that um, you know you you earn while you learn today it's, it's no longer a reality for someone to stop uh, feeding their family to go back to school for four years. Uh, so acknowledging that, we've invested significant uh, dollars into retraining initiatives, um, and, and we're working with employers to do that. So that's a critical piece, and that's an economic benefit, because with this new technology and the jobs that it brings, I mean, these are high-paying, high-skilled jobs in our communities, uh, and there's an incredible spin-off. As well, we look at, at the transition, and I want to take a step back more broadly. Um, with the right policies in place, we've seen over $16 billion in, a, in, in investment into our, into our automotive sector through uh, electrification and the priorities that we've put on, on electrifying our automotive sector through backed up by a critical mineral strategy that's working in partnership. I mentioned that Northern Tour just got back. Um, you know, we're seeing reclamation initiatives starting on day one, led by uh, indigenous communities. We're seeing uh, a critical mineral strategy that, that, uh, that is led in Northern Ontario so that the complete supply chain uh, can be developed. So in short, you asked about this technology, the economic benefit. I see clusters of, of supply chains. I see clusters of, of growth happening in Ontario, the North being probably one of the most exciting with our, with our ring of fire in Ontario. And that's bringing incredible economic benefit for job creation and the spin-off benefits with the supply roads. And when we address the permitting and the regulatory issues, we also see those same roads bringing in health care and vital social services uh, that more rural and remote communities depend on. I'm from rural Ontario, and we need to make sure that this transition doesn't leave behind rural and remote communities like mine. So we're very seized with that, and, and, and I'm incredibly excited for the future. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for that and bringing us home and speaking about being incredibly excited for the future. What's your, what's your one point on what gives you hope that we're going to be able to make this energy transition through this climate urgency we, we're facing as a world right now? Well, I would say, uh, honestly, youth. Um, I, I met with a, a youth group uh, just yesterday, and they're incredibly optimistic and, and excited, and I, I think as much as we've looked to technology, and you know, I, I don't 
look perhaps to certain social media venues as a, as, as a benefit, uh, there's certainly real challenges with that. But technology and talent, especially in, in Ontario, across Canada, when I look uh, stateside to the south, uh, that's in, enriching our lives. And when I spend time with youth, that's what leaves me optimistic about our future, a very positive outlook. So in short, it's youth. Love that, love that. Uh, Ralph, over to you. What, what is it that uh, gives, you, gives you hope that we'll make it through this? There's no question in my mind that for any individual, any organization to solve a problem, they first have to recognize that they have a problem. And I am delighted to hear and say that deniers of climate change are rapidly becoming an extinct species. And just look at the enthusiasm that you see at COP and just look in the U.S. N not to uh, not to be boastful, but in just a short period of time, we re-entered Paris, passed three pieces of landmark legislation, all of which are most of which are directed at funding new R&D, giving tax credits for carbon-free sources of energy. Just tremendous progress in the last uh, year and a half uh, in this regard. So, recognizing the issue and, and acting, Pat. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I was just thinking back a couple of weeks ago, my daughter was doing a, um, what she called a visual essay uh, and uh, on, on climate change, fighting climate change and what it means to her. And one of the slides actually showed the very thing I talked about earlier, the, uh, the you know, the hazy sky from back in 2005 versus the blue sky in, in 2015. And I actually, I started going down my little speech about how nuclear p played a big role. And she's like, okay, that's great, dad, but we got to do a lot more. And I said, you know what, you're right, you're absolutely right. And that gives me a lot of hope, you know, that people, she's 11, that people her age are this focused on it at such a young age, and that is one of their top priorities uh, in, in talking with their friends and going to school. Um, that gives me a lot of hope. Um, the, the, the other piece that I'd just touch on is what I, what I described before, where, uh, you know, we gotta stop talking about the different types of colors of hydrogen. I, I noticed one thing uh, you know, around here and around the policy uh, policy discussions in Canada, we talk a lot about working together. And it's no longer, you know, wind against nuclear, against solar. Everybody's coming together because we're going to need every tool in the box to fight climate change. And I'm seeing a lot of that happening right now. Thanks, Pat. And Francis, last last word to you. What makes you hope? Okay, so the, the, what gives me hope is the electricity advantage. Uh, the electricity advantage is we have a system that's 80% are carbon free already. Um, we're not dependent on any foreign power for our energy. Our markets are not being roiled by, by outside forces that are, are extorting our economies into recession and pushing our customers into poverty. We have a stable, uh, integrated North American electricity system. We operate in a stable and predictable regulatory and business environment. And finally, we've got an electricity sector with a proven track record of great breakthrough innovation. Everything from long distance transmission to nuclear technology, from carbon capture to creative customer solutions, our electricity advantage is undeniable. Go electricity. Okay, would everyone please uh, join me in, in thanking our panelists today. As I said, if, if, you, if you do have a question, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure the panelists will stick around to, to answer them. Thank you so much for joining us today.